Good afternoon, class. This is Professor Armbruster, and today I'll be talking to you about none other than the very great American, Benjamin Franklin. What can I say about Ben Franklin that you haven't already heard before? He is perhaps the most famous American of all and has been dubbed the quintessential American and the first true American by scholars over the many, many, many decades of Franklin research. Ben Franklin was born in 1706. I think I may have said 1709 in the previous video, but he was born just three years after Jonathan Edwards, so they are uh, colleagues or compatriots of the same era. He was born in 1706 on Milk Street in Boston in, seven, in Suffolk's backyard, and he lived a long, long life, dying in 1790. He was 84 years old. His background was completely different from Jonathan Edwards's. Edwards's was privileged, and he went to Yale as a young man and followed in the footsteps of his father and father-in-law, while Franklin was born to a poor working-class family, tenth of 15 children. I'll say that again. He was the tenth of 15 children. His father was a soap maker and a candle maker, and Franklin did go to a Boston grammar school, but was forced to leave so that he could apprentice his father at the age of 10. He had no formal education beyond grammar school. At age 12, he was given an apprenticeship to his brother in a printing office in Philadelphia. You will read about this in part one of his autobiography. He much preferred to work in the printing office because he loved to write and read and loved to learn as much as he could about these two fields. He was a very avid reader, and one of the reasons why his autobiography is so important in American literature is because he really underscores the significant benefit that reading and writing can give to any individual. He promotes American literacy above all else. And indeed, he went on to found the public library so that every citizen had access to books, no matter what their class, race, or family station was. This is one of the most important parts of the Franklin legacy. So he believed very strongly in the power of education and particularly in the power of the self to educate the self. He felt education could transform our lives and our souls and free us from the tyranny of religion and the church. So it's very important that you realize that unlike Edwards, Ben Franklin did not believe in formalized religion and in regular church-going practices, although he does state early on in his autobiography that he is a man of God because he believes in a power greater than himself. He simply does not believe in the dogma and doctrine of the church. This is important because he also did not want to... Um, ostracize himself with his writing and thus had to paint himself as a man of faith. He does describe himself later in the autobiography as a deist and this is someone who believes in God but in a non-interventional sort of way. So if you think back to the early settlers like William Bradford and John Winthrop you'll realize 
they really believed that God intervened and directed the course of our life, while Franklin believed that man, and only man, was in charge of his own destiny. This is the way in which he fits into the Enlightenment thinkers who began the trend in England in you know the late 1600s and the very first decade of the 1700s. But Franklin continues this trend and way of thinking in New England and the East Coast throughout the 1700s. So I also want to mention that um, Franklin, in his autobiography, does thank God for helping him to lead a good life even though he doesn't often show a religious side. As I said, he probably doesn't want to um, ostracize any of his readers. And he does highlight the very important role that his father played in his life and education, that his parents set examples for him, that they really encouraged conversation and questioning and learning around the dinner table, and that his father made a practice of bringing well-known writers and thinkers and speakers to his home so that the Franklin children could learn from them. It's fascinating to think about this and the way that the Franklin family enhanced their educational opportunities this way. You could think of it as the student who is homeschooled, and the parents supplement by bringing, you know, important folks over to talk at the dinner table with them. So um, let's look at the autobiography. Um, it's important for you to notice that Franklin really delineates his desire to better his writing, reading, and debate skills and that he really shows a very strong intellect from his earliest days. Also that he uses the practice of imitation to improve his writing. He, you know, takes examples of great prose and copies it so that he can learn how great writers write. This is an exercise that I recommend all of you do. Um, he shows an interest in constantly keeping tabs on himself. Also in part one, what's important is, and I want you to pay attention to this, is his use of the word errata. Franklin commits numerous errata. Think about his choice of this word and how different it is from Edwards' use of the word sin. Now, when you do something wrong, would you be more inclined to call it an errata or an error or a sin? What is the difference in using one word or the other? And how do these two small words, words signify the difference between enlightenment thinking of Franklin and the great awakening motivation of Jonathan Edwards? So that's what I'm going to leave you with as a start to the autobiography. And in my next video, I will talk to you about additional points in part one and then focus on part two of the autobiography.